please welcome Jay Hartzell. Thanks, Lil. I'm, I'm breaking one of my rules, which is following Lil Mills. Um, and uh, we came in together as former chairs, and she is the tigger of the school leadership. Um, one of my failures as senior associate dean was um, in not being able to convince her to remain as department chair. I'm still working on it, but I think it's a little late now. So um, she's been an inspiration um, across the school and in the accounting field, um, and she's, her leadership has been really, really appreciated by all. So thanks for all you do, Lil. Um, and, and I will admit that I have free ride off of her all the time. She was the one, when we were chairs together, who would get everything done on time, and so I would just ask for her version and change all the accounting to finance. Um, so, so thanks, Lil. Um, so we've got a, a, a great panel today. It's, it's my pleasure to, to have them here and say thank you all very much for joining us. Um, we're going to do more formal introductions in a minute, um, but I will, let me just tell you who's on, on stage with me. Um, so we have Jack Fraker from CBRE. Um, Jack is one of the, the world's leaders in industrial real estate, uh, comes from Dallas. Um, as you'll see, we, we tried to sort of stratify the, the real estate market and get people from different markets and different pieces of the business. So we've got industrial office and multifamily represented, Dallas, Austin, and Houston represented, um, and with this, the hopes that you can get some broad perspective on, on how things look from a real estate perspective. Um, in the middle is Pat Jones, who, um, who's with ARA here in, in Austin. Um, and he's an expert in, in multifamily, among other things, and he'll cover um, some of the Austin sector um, as well as the, the apartment business. Um, and Colby Mick from HFF in Houston, um, who will have lots to say, I'm sure, about many of you will have questions about what's going on with energy in Houston and those markets and how should we think about those things. Um, so thanks a bunch, uh, Colby, for joining us as well. So I've got a little bit, if I can get figure out how to do it, I've got a few slides I was going to cover. Thanks, Christine. Thank you. Um, so, so I've got a few slides I'm going to cover, and this just gets some data on the on the laid on the table, so everybody sort of is up to speed a little bit on what we're seeing in markets. Um, and this is a, a thank you slide. So thanks to Colby and, and Mark Gibson, who's the chair of our council, and and our friends at HFF for the data. They let us basically steal this and rebrand it, um, which which we greatly appreciate. So there's a disclaimer. This is theirs. I'm an academic. I don't have to disclaim anything. Um, so um, that's a small print that you can read at, at your leisure. Um, so this graph, and just, you know, from a distance, you can just look at the picture. This is transaction activity, um, investment activity in U.S. real estate, and you see the, the, the big run-up to 2007. Um, you see the 2008 and 9 bust, the crisis, um, and you see a very healthy rebound. So 2014, um, if you go back, looks about like, what, 2006, which gives you, gives you some sense of the health of the rebound um, in activity. I was talking to one of my colleagues who's teaching undergraduate real estate class, and it's already at the stage now where we, he has to explain the crisis to the undergraduates. Um, as he mentioned, I think they were in like fourth grade or something, you know, whatever it was. Um, so it, it's, you know, memories have faded, um, things are robust again, times are good, times are good in Texas especially, um, which we'll come back to, but it's, it's been a, a very healthy rebound, um, something that I think, um, you know, many of us have benefited from. Uh, this is across different uh, property types. So just to give you some sense that the rebound is, is, is pretty broad. So Apartments, industrial, office, and retail, um, and we'll get th go through as we talk. But I think to many of us, you probably followed it. But multifamily was the first to rebound, first to be talked about. So there was an idea coming out of the the housing uh, bust that more people were renting. Movement from people owning single family into apartments. There was the idea that the millennials may want to rent longer, may choose to stay in apartments. Um, Fannie and Freddie were still lending in that sector, so debt was comparatively cheap. Um, so you saw a rebound there. But really, you've seen now a much broader rebound across the rest of the property types um, as you go forward. And we'll hit on those as we, as, as we go through the panel discussion. Um, this is showing you the markets. And the print, again, is pretty small at the bottom. But what you'll see is that uh, the transaction volume is really weighted in the top markets. Um, and I'll be curious to hear the perspective of, of a group on stage. But I think what you've seen is some more breadth across those markets. And you've seen things like international investors investing in Austin, Texas. Um, which, is, which is quite interesting. So their taste and their willingness to invest across a broader spectrum of cities um, is growing. I think the, 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 what people call the gateway cities, the Los Angeles and New York and San Francisco's of the world, in many, many senses rebounded first. 
uh, but that rebound has been sort of spreading out throughout the country, um, which we benefited from um, in Austin as well as Dallas and Houston. Uh, this is showing you um, across markets. So the, t the top line are the major markets, and then you've got sort of breaking out the less, uh, the less major markets. So think about these as the, the New Yorks and San Francisco's of the world on the top, um, and then you get down into the, the middle tier, um, and then you've got the whatever, you know, Des Moines and Oklahoma City or something in the, in the, in the, the bottom tier. And what you get a perspective again on is that this, the rebound is, is broad, but that the major markets have benefited uh, the most and probably the earliest. Um, you see this, the rebound coming out of the crisis. People talked about going back to these gateway safe cities, the coastal markets first, um, places where it's hard to build, supplies constrained, um, places where talent wanted to go. One of the major themes that, um, that I've heard, at least in the last couple of years, is companies worrying about where talent wants to live, um, trying to locate their businesses in those, in those places. Even in New York, I've heard people talk about moving from midtown to downtown because the young professionals want to commute from Brooklyn. Um, so it's worth it making the managing directors from Connecticut go farther so that their um, more you know, mid-level um, uh, talent can come in from Brooklyn more conveniently. So these kinds of ideas of the interactions between talent and the economy, where do they want to be, um, where do they want to live, and then the companies following, I think, has been really interesting to watch in the last several years. And Austin's been a huge beneficiary of that. Texas has been a beneficiary. Um, you sit around, people talk about where do you want to work, it's the conversation is places like Austin, Portland, Seattle, Boston, the Bay Area, um, New York, et cetera. So this is all, of course, driven by the macro economy, and this is a slide just showing you how correlated real estate, pr commercial real estate prices are with employment growth. Um, so it all hinges on jobs as the employment growth has recovered, um, so is the commercial real estate prices. Um, one thing that everybody's been talking a lot about has still been interest rates. And many of you, are, I'm sure, are aware that we've had this sort of secular trend from the 80s where interest rates have declined. And the question has been, everybody keeps waiting for it to go back up. And every time the Fed has a press conference or interacts, the question is, is the easing ending? Are rates going to go back up? And what does that mean? And real estate is certainly um, influencing this in a couple of ways. One sense is that for many buildings, the cash flows that come off those buildings look like a bond while the tenant's in place. So it's a bond type payoff, a fixed known payoff for a while. And so if rates rise, there's concern about the value of that, of that bond like payoff. The second part, as you know, is real estate is heavily debt dependent. Um, and so the, the ability to attain cheap financing is, is um, linked to interest rates in the environment. So there's concern that if rates rise, then the financing will get more difficult, um, implying that prices may suffer. Um, so there's been this ongoing question about, about what's going to be the impact of real estate um, on real estate of interest rates. But the other confounding effect, effect is that in many senses, in many investors' minds, real estate's an inflation hedge. That if inflation is what is driving some of the um, interest rate pressures, that will eventually be reflected in leases, um, rent checks. And so as those checks rise, real estate acts as a natural hedge. And we'll come back to that as, as, in, as we talk about how investors are thinking about real estate in their portfolios. And this is just showing you, a, you know, a, a, a path of interest rates. And we've had these conversations for years now where many of these kinds of, of events, we sit around and talk about when will rates go up. And, and the forecast is typically eventually, but often it just hasn't materialized yet. So the top line, um, the dotted line, is showing you previous forecasts of what, where interest rates would be. Um, and the stars showing you where they they're actually have been. So we continue to have people worry about eight rates are about to rise and what's going to happen when they do. Um, but it just has not yet materialized. And part of that's probably the global growth. The global growth has not been quite as robust and as broad and as, as strong as one would like to see. Um, and, you know, Texas rebounded in many senses first, and so the rest of the country is catching up, but there hasn't been the need to uh, sort of curtail the economic growth by raising rates uh, very quickly. So what about investors? So uh, I think one of the things that is certainly um, clear to many of us out of the financial crisis is the linkage between capital markets and real estate. Um, we, we have a real estate center here that is linked in the finance department. In many cases, we used to have to go out and sort of tell the story about why it makes sense for real estate professionals to worry about the finance side of the business. I think that story is much clearer after the 2008 crisis where being able to tell, tell how capital market inflows and outflows affect real estate fundamentals and how they're interrelated has been a much clearer case. So this gives you some sense of appetite uh, by institutional investors for real estate and the point here to take away is that they still have, um, if anything, a target that's higher than ever as far as the, the dollars they want to put to work into commercial real estate. So um, as the rebound has happened, as, as things have, have recovered, these institutional investors still, real estate, still view real estate as a key part of their portfolio. And if anything, it's an increasingly key part of their portfolio. 
And I, the last two slides are just to show you some sense of fundraising and, and funds that have been raised and that are on the sidelines that are, that are to, to be deployed. And these are closed in funds and you can see the assets under management, how much that's risen over time, um, as well as how much dry powder they have. So the dry powder is in the, the blue bars at the bottom. So money waiting to be invested they could invest. And then the gray bars um, give you some sense of, of what has been invested. And it's, again, a very robust, healthy picture for commercial real estate. A lot of appetite to invest, a lot of dry powder sitting on the sidelines waiting for opportunities, um, which, you know, if, for example, in Houston, it'll be interesting to see how energy plays out. And I've heard to some people already talk about how that may actually provide more opportunities if they have the, the capital waiting to invest as, as the market develops. Um, these are open in more core funds. So these would invest in more what, we, what people real estate would call the Class A side. Um, so downtown, you know, the frost towers of the, of the world. And, and you see, again, um, their funds are back up and recovered and, and, and bigger than ever. Um, so again, the, the appetite for capital to be in the real estate sector is, is very strong. Um, it bodes well. There's this looming question, there are looming questions about interest rates, about energy, um, but you've seen a very broad, healthy recovery, which Texas, if anything, has benefited more from. So, you know, six months, 12 months ago, we had some conversation with one of our council members and asked, how are things going? And his comment was something like, if you can't be happy in real estate in Texas right now, what do you want? Um, and we've got maybe arguably a few more headwinds now with, with, with Houston maybe in particular, which um, I know our panel will hit on. Um, but it's been a, a series of good times and it's been a, uh, a good space to be in. So with that, let me get started with our panel. And uh, maybe what I'll do is, is, since I didn't give the full bios, and, and we won't read everybody's bios, but maybe just start with Jack and go down the row and have each of you sort of mention what it is you're working on, maybe give an example of what kinds of deals you're working on, uh, what your firm does, and then we'll get started more into the direct question. So Jack, do you mind starting off? No, yeah, fine. So I'm, I'm with CBRE and uh, I live in Dallas. And we're a, we're a global real estate services company. Uh, today we have about 44,000 employees and we're all over the world. And we provide uh, real estate services such as uh, leasing buildings on behalf of landlords or identifying lease space on behalf of corporate tenants. We do a lot of property management. And then we also have capital markets, which is the area I'm involved in. And we may have as many as seven or eight other service lines. Uh, I, I work on in the capital markets area, which is investment sales, selling properties for and to uh, institutions. And I happen to have specialized in industrial. And if I had to do it over again, I might specialize in um, Manhattan office building sales because uh, those properties in Manhattan cost $1,000 a square foot. And each building in Manhattan on average is about a million square feet. So each building is a billion dollars whereas industrial real estate is a lower per square foot property type. Let's say it averages $50 a square foot. So I have to work you know, 20 times harder than, <laughs> than anybody in Manhattan. But we sell industrial real estate and uh, this past year, the team that I had up, uh, which is mostly big institutional sales, we sold 135 million square feet of buildings. Uh, and to give you some perspective, I think Austin has altogether 35 million square feet of industrial buildings. So it's almost, our volume was almost four times the size of uh, Austin. Uh, you know, 60 or 60 or so different cities, class A buildings, class B buildings, uh, added up to $8 billion of value or eight Manhattan office buildings is another way to look at it. So, and so that's what, that's what I do is work on investment sales for industrial real estate. It's a real popular asset class with inst institutional investors. It matches up very well from an actuarial perspective for pension plan CIOs is predictable, reliable. It's not as exciting as an office building or even as exciting as apartments and, and other property types, but it's, it's relatively predictable, doesn't cost a lot of money to operate it, and that's why it's a, a very, very desired asset class. Thanks, Jack. And I, I also should brag on Jack for a minute. We, we um, just this year in our real estate center came up with the idea that, well, we borrowed the idea of having an executive in residence, and Jack's our first one. So. He's been great for our students this year. He comes down on, on Fridays and meets with students and talks to them about how to get into real estate because they should be meeting. And I've heard just rave reviews of all the work he's done. So thanks a bunch for doing that as well, Jack. Oh, I enjoy it. Um, so Pat, do you want to talk sure. a little about ARA and, and apartments and what you do? Sure. So ARA, Apartment Realty Advisors, we're a national brokerage firm. Uh, we represent sellers of multifamily. We're focused on multifamily. Uh, 25 offices around the country. We sold roughly $12 billion of multifamily last year nationally. Um, in Austin, uh, that's about, we sold about $1 billion last year, about 65 transactions. We have 
three different um, groups in Austin, um, uh, San Antonio and Austin conventional multifamily, the National Student Housing Group, and the National Manufactured Housing Groups, and their dedicated teams. I spend my days, um, uh, you know, selling all the cranes you see, selling institutional quality Austin and San Antonio assets. And um, all right, thanks, Colby. So I'm Colby Mick, and I'm in Houston with HFF. We're a 35-year-old company. We were started in Houston as a, as a predominantly capital markets-focused commercial real estate firm. So we do a lot of the same things the Jack firm does, but we focus exclusively on debt and equity transactions and investment sale transactions, uh, and we're not in the service side of the business with leasing and management. We've uh, got about 700 people around the country in 22 offices. Uh, a vast majority of our people are in Texas since our roots were here. We did about $64 billion in transactions last year uh, across the U.S., and we, we transacted in just about every market in the U.S. Uh, I've been with the firm 10 years. I focused uh, on the debt and equity side of our business. I, I would say that I spend most of my time in the office sector, but I'm somewhat of a generalist, so I work a little bit on everything. Great. And maybe back to you, Colby. You, you talked about um, institutional investors and capital markets and sourcing debt and equity. Uh, could you talk about how investors think about real estate in a portfolio context? How do they think about it relative to other asset classes? What, what role does it play in their portfolio? And, and what's that mean when you go out and look sure. at, at assets? So if you think about it in the, in the institutional space, and I think some of these slides really give you a, a, a good flavor for the types of investors in real estate. But if you, if you just think about the, uh, the pension and endowment world and, and the alternative investments that they have uh, amongst fixed income, commodities, other, other different types of investments, Commercial real estate is a pretty meaningful subset of that. And so if you look just on average across most investors' portfolios, somewhere between 9 and 10% is the average that you're going to see of AUM, the percentage of AUM that's invested in the real estate space. And it's, it's, it's attracting more and more attention, and, and really the reason why has a lot to do with the performance that real estate's had over time. So if you go look at, at commercial real estate and compare it to commodities, you compare it to the S&P 500, you compare it to uh, corporate bonds and you look at the one, five, 10, 15 year performance uh, from a total return standpoint, real estate's outperformed every one of those categories. So it's garnered more and more attention and it's about a $5 trillion industry today. So it's, it's not insignificant and it's, it's, it's a testament to what we do when you see groups like CalPERS, who's the largest domestic pension fund in the United States with about 300 billion in assets under management, has taken the real estate allocation as of the end of 2014 from 10% to 13% in 2015. So just a, a jump like that has meaningful significance in our space. So to answer the question more specifically, what's the right allocation? It really varies, but we see it averaging around nine, but the good thing is we see it grow. Right, thanks. Yeah, one of the, one of the interesting challenges, we will give data to students and ask them to run the classic finance models and come up with how much should be in real estate. And the recent performance generally has been so strong, return is high, risk is compared to low, and it's not that correlated with other asset classes. So if you just blindly pl plug it into a model, you could get 25, 30% allocation. So we say, well, that's probably not quite realistic. There's some issues with the data, but still numbers like 10 to 15% are not um, uncommon out of those kinds of, uh, those kinds of frameworks. But, um, so Pat, what, you, what, kind of, what are investors' appetites today in, in the markets and, and that you work in, and what are they looking for, and, and what kinds of assets and, and returns and, and those kinds of things. Sure, so um, institutions are uh, you know, really focused on urban infill, walkability, high rises, mid rises. Um, that seems to be where they're focused. Um, get a lot more private investors in the garden style properties in the suburban areas. Um, we see foreign capital coming in and we sold four garden style deals to Canadians last year. Uh, Israeli money, we sold a, a large uh, community in San Antonio to a, a, an Israeli group. And to Colby's point, it's, it's capital flowing into fast-growing cities, and um, they're watching the demographic flows um, in migration, uh, employment growth, which is all, it's great to be in Texas, uh, is, is, you know, what we've been saying in our office. Um, all the Texas cities have been, have been you know, really um, uh, doing well. And as we look, um, you know, we, we have these, um, monthly calls around ARA. Midwest seems to be, you know, still hurting and or slowly coming out of a recession. Um, California, you know, our governor's been camping out there, uh, moving people to Texas. And so um, in, inflows of folks, fills apartment communities. Um, uh, the appetite's robust. Cap rates are extremely low. Um, returns are very aggressive right now. 
and it's just because, um, you know, what is the alternative? And um, we're seeing um, institutions um, really want to own multifamily, um, and that's you know, cash buyers, levered buyers. I think the, the most shocking thing to me is if you go back to 07, where you know we obviously hit a peak, um, people were using CMBS debt and um, they were highly levered, and the numbers didn't make sense. If you look at today, um, predominantly we're seeing Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae as the lender, and the numbers make sense. They're, they're looking at trailing numbers to underwrite a property, um, whereas back in 07, it was pro forma. And so in the downturn, we saw a bunch of investors get washed out that probably had no business um, you know, being highly levered and being in the business. Today, it's normal to see 70, 75% loan-to-value, maybe even down to 60% uh, um, loan-to-value. Uh, Freddie Fannie and or life companies being the predominant lenders and being the governor of, of returns. And so while cap rates may be low, interest rates are extremely low. So everything underwrites today and, and uh, I consider it very healthy. Great, thanks. And for those of you that may not just sort of lingo definition. So cap rates, many of you I'm sure know, but cap rates are the ratio of earnings to price. So if you're used to the stock markets, it's the flip of the PE ratio, right? So cap rates low, price is high. Yeah. Um, and and if, if cost of debt's low, then it all, the math works. Right. Um, so, Jack, who are, who are buying and selling industrial properties? You mentioned why investors like the, the asset class. Um, what kinds of players? Yeah, are I, can, I can mention some uh, buyers in addition to it's really some of the same groups that buy office and buy apartments. But another uh, new emerging group is the uh, non traded REIT industry. So, we all know about public New York Stock Exchange REITs. And in our industrial s sector, the biggest one is Prologis, another big company is Duke. Uh, but there's a new uh, uh, segment of capital coming in, which is the non-traded uh, REIT, where John Hugh, private citizen, can go out and buy shares in these companies, and they get a, uh, a dividend of plus or minus 6% on a nominal share price of $10. And as the uh, aging population, baby boomers, I mean, I'm almost a baby boomer myself now. No, just kidding. I'm, I'm actually a baby <laughs> boomer, and as you get older in life, you start to worry about your uh, retirement. You don't want to lose your principal. You don't want to go out and buy Yahoo stock today and then have it go down 25% the next day. As you get closer to retirement, you want predictable income. And uh, real estate in general and industrial real estate provides that kind of uh, yield. And Colby mentioned the big endowments and the pension funds. But particular, answering your question about who's active in industrial, it's the public REITs, it's the non-traded REITs, it's various uh, pension fund advisors, the advisors that advise CalPERS or Texas, retirement, Texas Teachers Retirement System, public uh, pension plans like that. But now it's getting very interesting. It's such a good asset class industrial, and the U.S. is such a popular place for foreign investors that we're seeing new profiles of investors we haven't seen before. I mean, right now I'm, I'm here in Austin today, but my team in Dallas is touring around these group, this group from Japan. There's four people that flew in from Japan. They're trying to buy this really large, multi-city portfolio we have. And you know, I don't know if any of them really can. There's one person that can speak passable uh, English, but they're touring every one of these uh, buildings today. <coughs> Within the past month, we've had uh, people from Quebec province. You know, they're all French speaking. They're touring these industrial buildings. We've had people from uh, uh, Abu Dhabi come and look at our buildings. We've had people from Norway. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. People from Australia, huge uh, Australian uh, interest in, in U.S. industrial real estate. So now, and it was already a competitive field with all these, these big U.S. institutions, but now there's foreign investors too. And all of that competition has, has forced uh, yields down or cap rates down. So it's, it's, it's good for the sellers at, at this time in the market. Great, thanks. And Colby, what about fundamentals? So could you talk about fundamentals in the markets uh, where, where you operate? Sure. So I mean, and, and I'm sure we'll expand on this, but obviously the headlines in Houston right now relative to the ener ener energy industry has had a pretty significant impact on us from a perception standpoint. The reality of the fundamentals in Houston right now are still very favorable. If you look at really what's transpired over the past three years, Houston's been the beneficiary of some really, really phenomenal job growth and some really phenomenal population growth. If you just look, if you go back 25 years in Houston, we've added about 100,000 people a year. And in the past 10, we've added a million and a half people to our population, which, which not, a, not really any market in the country can, can say the same thing. At the same time, we've added, on average, 
about 80,000 jobs a year in each of the last three years. And all of that coupled with each other has allowed us to have some pretty tremendous inventory growth, particularly in the office sector, but also in the residential sector and industrial sectors as well. And so fundamentally, up until the end of calendar year 2014, we were really operating at a peak performance level from a fundamental standpoint. And we're in a really interesting discovery period right now through the first 60 days of the year because people are trying to figure out what a correction in the energy market ultimately means in the real estate market. And at the end of the day, it comes down to demand. And we're all trying to determine what our job growth numbers are gonna look like in 2015. And in 2015, we're not expecting to have 125,000 net new jobs like we did last year. We're expecting something probably in, in the 30 to 40% of that number range. And, and that'll really dictate what demand is. And so we're in an interesting spot in Houston where it still feels good. It still takes me twice as long to drive to work as it used to take me five years ago. Uh, there are plenty of people in restaurants and shops and it, it feels a lot like it did last year and the year before, but we've got a heightened sense of awareness largely due to the perception of what happened in Houston 30 plus years ago, the last time there was a major energy correction. So at the moment, Jay, it feels really good, but everybody's got their antennas up. And what about the uh, capital providers? Are they starting to pull back, be hesitant, or is it still? I would say so, I mean, but, but it, it really varies. So you have, uh, from an equity perspective, if you've got a major presence in Houston, Texas today, you're very concerned about what potentially could happen. Um, and I think if you've got a, a memory of, of, of what your experience was 30 years ago, you're fearful that that same thing may transpire in the next 24 months. If you really study the differences between the early 80s and what we think we'll experience in the next several years, just fundamentally, and what the, the composition of our economy is, it's drastically different. And so I think people are, are concerned that it could get worse, but the, the people that have truly core real estate and they're in great locations with great quality assets, those people still feel very good long-term in Houston because of a lot of the good fundamentals that are there. And I would say it, it's, it's interesting to see the other end of the spectrum where people who see this as an opportunity to get into Houston where they've been priced out of the market for the past 24 months and feel like there's enough of a disconnect today for them to be successful in, in, in obtaining assets. So I would tell you that, that same comment as previously, there's a heightened sense of awareness. People are a little bit more conservative as it relates to assumptions in their underwriting. But people, people, people have to determine if there's gonna be really a distress type opportunity, which we don't really see that exists today. Uh, we're just in a different state of the market fundamentally to where there's not necessarily gonna be a wave of, of foreclosures and a wave of distressed assets that, that people can step in and acquire at a discount. So I would say the sentiment is still largely good, but it's just, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit more cautious in their approach, both from a debt and equity perspective. Great, thanks. Pat, what about you? What about sure. Uh, perception of a reality, um, you know, if we're in Texas, if, if, if Houston catches a cold, everyone's affected. Uh, it's benefiting Austin and San Antonio. We, we started um, receiving calls in January from people, uh, everything from capital, institutional capital providers down to private syndicators that say, I need to find something in San Antonio or Austin because I'm not allowed to go to Houston. Forget the fundamentals. Um, it's perception. They can't go to the investment committee with the word Houston. And um, as an example, um, our Houston office uh, was telling the story that um, in their JV equity um, raising, and that's you know, putting money into new construction deals, they had about 25 deals pulled in December where the institution just left the building and said, I'm out. And um, fortunately, they're coming to Austin and San Antonio um, where they were previously pretty cautious on Austin and San Antonio. Um, you know, fundamentals of apartments are outstanding today. Um, everybody, it's hard to find a, an apartment community that's not 94, 95% occupied. Um, rent growth has been around five to 7%, pick your city in Texas. Um, I'll just talk Austin, because it's my backyard. In migration last year, 66,000 people. That's a staggering number for the city of Austin. Uh, job growth around 35,000. And um, it just means a bunch of people are moving here. Fortunately, I think all those people majority of them are renters. And um, so fundamentals are strong. The concern, um, just like back in 06, is supply. How many cranes go up? How many units you're gonna build? Um, and that's all over Texas and uh, all over the country for that matter, based on where we are in the cycle. But again, um, Austin, you're building about 15,000 units. Uh, lease ups have gone very well. 
Um, no one, uh, I haven't seen any, any problems with the supply. And what I'm finding is the institutions 18 months ago, super cautious on Austin because they looked at the number of units being built as a percentage of our stock. So you're building 15,000 units, but you only have about 135,000 units in the city. Um, that concern is now, you know, we're kind of moving through. Um, we've had some transactions happen. So um, build, lease up, sale. Now they can point to a success story. Um, institutions seem to be circling back. It is my opinion, um, you know, our cap rates will decrease from here just because of the competition and the lack of product and compliments of Houston. Um, you've got people just looking from, we get coupled a lot with uh, the Carolinas, Florida, Texas, the smile states. Um, that seems to be very popular and that's you know, how we're seeing all these investors come in. And so our challenge is just finding product to sell, but fundamentals um, healthy and or strong. I had one thing to what you said about supply and, and, and about assets or opportunities being dropped on the development side in Houston. I would say that's absolutely the case. And if you take the development side of the business, that's essentially shut down in Houston. And it goes back to the comment about where's demand going to be. And so if you had a project that was not capitalized as of the end of the year, you're pretty much on hold. And we think that in a lot of ways that could be a good thing. Because if you look at what we have under construction in the office sector, we've got about 19 million square feet under construction. Our residential sector is very much the same way. We've got 28,000 units under construction with another 20 in lease up. So we've got a lot of supply coming to the market anyway, and, and, a, and, a, and an immediate abrupt stop to that is actually a pretty good thing to let fundamentals catch back up. And before we um, go on it to go to industrial, Pat, could you talk about, I hear the, and for those of you that have, are coming back to Austin to visit today, um, I hear a lot of MBA students and others complain about rents. So can you give some <laughs> historical perspective on what's Austin's suffered through or benefited from it, depending on your perspective, yeah, um, sure. last several years? Uh, I'm a cheerleader, build, baby, build. Just, you know, <laughs> keep going. Um, Austin, it's a political hot potato. Affordability is a real problem because developers aren't building workforce housing. That's not sexy, that doesn't sell. Um, so I'm, I'm not in the political game, so I won't necessarily touch that, but uh, it's a real problem. If you wanna live um, urban walkability, it's expensive. And so to put that in perspective, that's $2 a square foot. And five years ago, it was normal to, you know, a dollar fifteen to a dollar thirty a square foot. Um, so you've had a dramatic increase with you know brand new fancy granite countertop product. Now what the developers have learned to do is you know tiny units so that it can be somewhat more affordable. But um, uh, you know it, it's interesting. Um, even though we're in a supply boom, everyone's full. So if you go walk around and try to rent something, uh, it's expensive. And so then your, your decision process is: I'm, Am I getting a roommate? Um, you know, am I going to live in a studio? And um, we'll get to that when we talk about the millennials, um, because that's certainly the direction everyone's heading. But um, it's, it's a problem. What we find in the urban infill in Austin is those young folks living in tiny units. And when we go a little further out in suburban, uh, we find an older demographic, families. Um, and uh, certainly, you know, if you go to the suburban world, that's a $1.15, um, or to make it easy, $1,015 a month. And that's if you're in Round Rock. If you're around um, the center of Austin, it's going to be $3,000 a month for something pretty small. So rents are skyrocketing, um, and a lot of it's this in-migration, someone from California showing up thinking this is cheap. Um, and, and, you yeah. know, if, if it, it's, it, it, you hit the nail on the head, it's going to be a problem. Yeah. The world I think when I came as a grad student, I had a whole house for $400 a month. And I couldn't, the refrigerator <laughs> broke, and I couldn't afford a new one, so they raised rent to $420. Um, <laughs> and yeah, times have changed. So, Jack, fundamentals and industrial and, and, and all of Texas, if you want, Dallas in particular, yeah. what do you want to hit on? Well, I mean, I like to think that we're real good guys at uh, marketing and selling all these industrial properties. But what really it is is the fundamentals are helping us uh, sell these industrial properties. In my long career, the fundamentals in the United States and have never been as strong as they are now. Out of the top 60 uh, markets in the country, all of them have single-digit uh, vacancy rates which that's never happened. Uh, markets like Dallas, Houston, you know, are five or 6% vacant. So that's never happened before. And, uh, you know, that's coming on the heels of the uh, financial crisis we had from 2009 through 12, let's say. And, uh, and during that period of time, there was an absence of new supply. And it was interesting, from 87 to 2007, 
about 225 million square feet of new industrial buildings were developed every year, over for every year for 20 years in a row. And then in 2008, 9, 10, 11, the average was probably 40, 40 million square feet developed nationwide. And that's in a market that, uh, you know, according, according to which uh, uh, report you look at, we have about 20 billion square feet of industrial space in the United States. So very little new supply came on during that period of time, yet uh, tenant demand and net absorption continued to be positive. So the fundamentals are really strong. Uh, in, in a typical industrial lease, unlike an apartment lease, which just is a one-year lease, most industrial leases are probably five years. And so if a lease was negotiated by a landlord in 2008, 9, 10, or 11, those were you know, tough times, and most of those leases were way below the historical average lease rate. Now those five-year leases are coming up for renewal in 2015, 16, 17, and landlords, uh, which is one hand tied behind their back, they can still increase the rent you know, 25, 30% over what the negotiated rate was back in 2009. So that helps us tell the story about rental rate growth, because really and truly industrial real estate of, of all the asset classes, it's not all, it doesn't have constant rental rate growth. It's cyclical on growth. I mean, usually the, the property type gets overdeveloped in a market and that flattens out the uh, rental rate growth opportunities. But now, there's so much more tenant demand, so much more net absorption than new construction that there's a, at least a four or five year period of time where we're gonna be seeing significant growth. And you know, the markets that are seeing some of the best growth are supply constrained markets. You know, Los Angeles has an ocean on one side and uh, deserts and mountains on the other side. So it's a real finite piece of uh, area where you can build buildings. So and Florida, South Florida is the same way with the Everglades and the ocean on the other side. And, and, you know, so you, it's hard to build new buildings and so rents really go up and those markets are going up 10, 12, 15%. But even Dallas, Texas, and we don't have an ocean or a mountain range in uh, Dallas, but even our rents in Dallas are going up eight or nine percent. And that's part, that ties in with the, the cap rates or the yields that you were talking about earlier. So an investor can pay a low cap rate on a property in Dallas or Houston or, or any of these markets, and they can, they can realize though in two or three years, their returns are gonna be so much higher as they start to roll over those vintage leases from 2009, they'll start getting much higher uh, returns. So that's, a, that's a kind of an observation on the, uh, on the uh, fundamentals. Houston, we're selling industrial properties in Houston, and our firm sells office buildings and apartment buildings, buildings too, but industrial real estate in Houston has hasn't been as affected as you might think it would be by energy. I mean, we're taking uh, best and final, we call it best and final, even though it's probably a misnomer to, to call it that because it's not the final round usually. It, it goes <laughs> on and on and on, but we're doing, we're in the best and finals on this beautiful class A industrial park in Houston. And the pricing is a uh, record low cap rates and really high per square foot prices. And, and so that it depends on the property type and the set sector of Houston that you're involved in, but we really haven't seen it affect industrial as much as other property types. One of the great things about talking to Jack is that he will describe industrial parks as beautiful. Yes, uh, they are. <laughs> so we talked about, and, and this is a little off script, but I'm, I'm sure you, got, you all can handle it. So we talked about cap rates. Just can you give the crowd a little bit of a feel for what, what they are in today's market? So again, sort of think about this as earnings to price ratios. And Jack, do you want just broadly and sort of you know, whether it's Houston, Dallas, however you want to think about it, but core, core yeah, market. I can do it. So, well, we're selling a deal right now in Los Angeles, and the cap rate is 4%. So uh, that, that investor is, is hoping, and they probably will experience much higher yields over their hold period as rents grow, go up. So that's a 4%. It's kind of low in the nation for a stabilized uh, property. Um, what might be like an IRR, un unlevered on that kind of thing? Uh, you know, unlevered IRR on that would be uh, 7 Six and a half, probably six and a half or seven, maybe seven. And then Dallas uh, cap rates would be in the 5.25 to 5.75 range. Houston would be similar to that. Uh, Austin would be a little bit higher because the uh, property types in Austin are generally speaking not pure distribution space. They usually have some sort of a heavy labor uh, component, so a lot more build out in the space. And so cap rates are maybe 50 basis points higher. So. 6% to 6.5% yeah. cap rates here in uh, Austin. 
but it's all over the country now, even markets that are in the middle of the nation, uh, Indianapolis. And these, some of these markets are not considered primary markets for office or other property types, but they are major supply chain markets. Columbus, Indianapolis, Memphis. Um, Stuff like FedEx. Texas. FedEx, yeah. Louis Louisville, Kentucky, right now is one of the hottest markets, believe it or not, and it's because it's all tied in with the uh, e-commerce and internet uh, shopping patterns in our country now. And so most of those big internet uh, e-commerce distribution centers are in places like Louisville. So even markets like Louisville, uh, Kentucky have low sixes cap rates. And you can ask the other property Yeah, types. Pat, what about apartments? Sure, institutional quality apartments where you mostly have institutional bidders and uh, buying all cash, it's a four and a half cap rate, uh, maybe four, seven, five cap rate. And the perception there is um, there's nothing broken, it's a beautiful asset, and um, it's just gonna clip a coupon for years, put it in a fund. Um, value add is the by far largest space in our business, meaning I'm gonna buy an 80s vintage, 90s vintage, and maybe on up to 2005 vintage property, and um, uh, rehab the interiors, granite countertops, lighting, hardware. Um, that's the largest space of what we do, and uh, those cap rates, um, you know, five and a half cap rate, now I have to caveat, they're not cap rate buyers. They're looking at a five year IRR in their business plan where they're gonna do all these rehabs, bump the rents a hundred bucks a month, and therefore they hit a mid-teens levered IRR. Um, and, and most of those are levered buyers. Whereas um, back to your point, um, the cash buyers, that would be an unlevered, call it six or seven for the institutions. Thanks, Colby? So it, it, it widely depends upon the quality of the product, but assume best of the best, core infill real estate, uh, multi-tenant office, mid fives to six on a going in cap rate basis and from an unlevered return in Houston for best of the best, six to 7% unlevered IRR over 10 years and levered using 40 to 50% debt, call it nine to 10. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of data points where the value add transactions have traded at cap rates well below that. So you may be going in on a four and a half or five, but you may be solving to a, an unlevered eight or nine, depending upon what kind of growth that you actually have. Um, just compare that to other markets, other major markets around the US. Um, Manhattan, we've got trades that are unlevered five, five and a half uh, over 10 years, yeah. IRR. Yeah. So you're yeah. going in cap rates in the threes. Uh, same thing in San Francisco for best of the best product. But again, they're trading at that levels because of the growth that you believe that you can achieve uh, with rents that are well above uh, what may be contractually in place today. The other piece to it as well is credit. If you've got a long-term credit lease, uh, there are buyers in the yield space that will look as much to that coupon as they will to real estate and look at the real estate even at a, say a five cap as a premium to what an investment grade tenant's credit may be or what, what, it, what their bonds may yield if they were just to buy the corporate debt. So uh, if, if, you could, if you could buy corporate paper at 4% and you could buy the same real estate on a long-term lease at five. There are sometimes buyers that are willing to push the envelope on cap rates just as a result of that. It's like a quarter bond plus, right? You get the real estate behind it. And exactly. Yeah. And so um, maybe you could pick up Colby there on, on, you mentioned demand and you mentioned energy. What are the drivers demand office uh, space? So you can touch on energy. I, I'd also be curious on your thoughts. One of the things that we've talked to some about is the, the trends in hoteling, square foot per office worker, um, and people now want to work in one giant open space with a ping pong table where you can take your dog in. Um, so what are you seeing? Sure. Uh, you know, it's, so you know. Houston's a little different than a market like Austin where you, you know, the, the, tech, the tech environment in Austin uh, is mirrors a lot of what happens in Santa Monica and West LA. Dogs and ping pong. A ping pong table, so we don't have any of that in our office space. <laughs> we, we just renewed our lease and we use all our TIs on painted carpet and that's about as creative as we got. So we, uh, I would tell you in, in Houston in particular, if you, do, you really have to think about the composition of the tenancy and you largely uh, are dominated by energy companies. And so uh, the energy market is really pretty interesting when you stratify the, really the people that work within that space. And there was a period of time from the mid eighties to the mid nineties where really nobody got in the energy business. And so the phenomenon over the past three or four years has been that a lot of the people that are on their way out that are 55 plus and are, are entering retirement uh, are, are leaving a pretty significant generational gap in management within those firms. And so over the past five years, a lot of these corporations have been really focused on recruiting and retaining the best and the brightest talent. 
kids that are coming out of UT that are getting offered six-figure salaries at 21 years old with a signing bonus to come work for Exxon, to come work for Chevron or Shell or Phillips or Conoco or, or go down the list. And so historically, a lot of these companies have been in office campuses that have existed for 30 or 40 years. They're much more dilapidated. They're less efficient. They were, they were compelling at the time when they were built, but a lot of them are, are so focused on recruiting and retaining and which is exactly why Exxon has decided to go spend over $1,000 a foot on a three and a half million square foot campus just north of Houston in the Woodlands, and they've built a city. It's 300 acres. They've got a dry cleaners. They've got daycare. They've got fitness facilities. They've got four restaurants. They've got a full environment that people would live and enjoy and would be thrilled to go to work and never leave, and, and, and they want to recruit and retain the best talent and offering those types of amenities is what differentiates them from the other 50 companies that are offering the same salaries. So uh, from, a, from a workspace standpoint, it, it, what's, what's unique in Houston is, is really the corporate campus, and it's not just Exxon, it's Chevron, it's Shell, it's Conoco, it's Phillips 66, it's Southwestern Energy. All of these corporations have built half a million to million square foot campuses in the past five years or have them underway right now, and that's been the game changer in Houston. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear kind of compare and contrast Colby and Pat between, you know, the Austin story and the urban infill apartments versus the Woodlands and the corporate campus. Is it that, that Exxon, these big firms, can't get the scale they need in downtown Houston? Is it that their, their new petroleum engineers want to live in the Woodlands? What are they thinking about in terms of? I would say, I mean, walkability is important, just like it is in residential. Walkability is important. And, you know, Chevron is a group that's got two and a half million square feet downtown already, and they're gonna build another tower sandwiched between, between all of them. They have the same opportunity to move into the suburbs like Exxon did, and, and a, lot of these, a lot of the growth of these campuses, a lot of them are West Houston and what we call the Energy Corridor, and those, those, those businesses are located there largely because their population is there. And if you think about the broader subset of their workforce, the population in Houston has shifted into those suburban areas, so it's about being closer to their employees. Uh, but there are others like in the Chevron example where they've taken the, the kind of the opposite approach and said we want the urban infill walkability and we want our people to be in Houston's core where those amenities exist. And so it really varies, uh, but a lot of the same things that, that renters seek in an apartment complex, the, the nice amenities and the full service type concierge approach, um, a lot of businesses are trying to accomplish whether they're infill or suburban. Thanks. And Pat, can you talk about uh, drivers demand apartments? Sure. Uh, in the apartment business, we kind of have a demographic dream. Um, if you look at uh, renters as a percent of population, back in 05, roughly 50% of America was renters. Um, if you look at 2014, it's roughly 62% are renters. Millennials, we mentioned it earlier. So for those of you that don't know, because I had to go read what they were, um, it's everyone born between 1980 in year 2000, uh, that's about 92 million people. To put that in perspective, the baby boom, 77 million people. So this is the largest generation in the history of our country. Um, they um, are you know, in renter age, uh, 25 to 34 years old. Um, so that is largely who's filling the apartments, uh, filling the apartment communities. The developers have studied and adapted to them. Um, you're seeing 70% one bedrooms urban infill and walkability is all the rage. Transit-oriented design we throw around at every rail stop in Austin. You will see apartments going up if they haven't already been built. The city incentivizes them um, to build there and the city um, will disincentivize you to build two blocks away in a single family area. So it's very um, tightly controlled and, and this is nothing, I mean, it may be new in Austin. This has been happening all over the country in more dense environments. So urban walkability is, is all the rage and it's driven by this millennial boom. Home ownership has decreased, um, and you all heard that on the news, but if you look at the millennials, I looked at the Goldman Sachs um, report on them, they are, um, you know, commitments are being pushed off. Let's get married later, let's buy homes later. Um, I want a car, but I'll share a car, not buy a car. So you, you see zip cars and things like that happening in major urban cities. And so their tastes are changing, they'll live in tiny, um, apartments um, so that they can be urban and walkable. And the old adage that you'd spend 30% of your income on the home is now 50 or 60% that they'll spend on an apartment, but their you know, transit costs may be lower or 
they, um, they're, they're pinching in other ways because they want to be in the urban core. Now, it doesn't mean our suburban properties aren't doing well, um, but it just, if you looked at, you know, 65% of Austin's pipeline of new apartments is in and around the CBD. And so um, in the suburban areas, uh, we find older demographic and um, uh, families and uh, for all the reasons that anyone moves there, uh, good schools and things of that nature. Thank you. Jack, what are the drivers in industrial? You mentioned e-commerce and how that's going. And maybe, if you don't mind, hit a little bit on what the modern industrial property looks like compared to what it might have looked like 20, 30 years ago. Sure. Well, there you have the big drivers in industrial real estate today are are, is the e-commerce uh, sector. Just to give you an example, Amazon.com has built 30 million square feet of distribution centers in the past three years. You know, it's, each one of those buildings is typically a million square feet and they're highly automated on the inside and ro robots and uh, it's, you know, unbelievable state-of-the-art specifications and physical features in those buildings, but they still end up having uh, 1,500 employees. So these buildings are 36 foot clear. They're designed so that they can have some mezzanine space inside the building. But, and then there's a giant field of parking outside. So that's a big driver, Amazon.com, but besides them, Walmart, Target, you name it, every big uh, uh, shopping uh, d department store type uh, company has an e-commerce uh, facility around the country. Another big driver though that's not, it's not as exciting as that is the um, light industrial buildings, which are smaller tenant oriented, let's say 50,000 square foot tenants. Most of the tenants in those types of buildings for years were, were tied to the construction industry in general, uh, also specifically single family housing. So when we were having all these houses built, which got us into a little bit of a problem in the 2006 and seven, but all those houses have uh, ceiling fans, tile, toilet features, uh, furniture, carpet, doorknobs, lights, all the things that go into an, a house at some point in time were in, were in a warehouse before they went into that finished product. So when the single family housing market came to a complete stop, that affected small tenants and affected the light industrial sector of our inventory. But now, wh whether it's apartments that are being developed and the gradual recovery in the single family housing, you're seeing a, that's a big driver as well. Interesting also is the automotive industry is a big driver for warehouse space. You know, the, the cars are manufactured in Detroit or some big plant someplace, but there's a, you know, a, a thousand probably vendors that provide components for those cars. And, and that industry, as we all know, has come completely back from where it was in 2009. So the automotive industry is a big driver. There's a lot of uh, uh, sub industries, uh, cons uh, various consumer goods, in, in 2009, when the Great um, Recession happened, the only uh, industry that was still leasing more and more warehouse space was uh, dog food and pet supplies. <laughs> so people, when they got down and they were sad, and didn't have a job and losing their house, they still would keep buying pet food. And we, there was a lot of big leases made back in that period of time. But generally speaking, the big drivers are uh, e-commerce in today's market. And, and Dallas, uh, Texas, Houston, Texas, and Texas in general is a great place for those e-commerce use, uses. We're right in the middle of the country and we have uh, you know, great uh, infrastructure with highways and uh, rail, railroads, and in the case of Houston, the port. So the, it's, the, da Texas is considered one of the top industrial real estate markets in the, in the country. Dallas, in fact, is considered the third or fourth largest market in the nation and, and most popular market for tenants as well as investors. Thanks. So before we uh, open up the Q&A, maybe just a, a, the, the typical crystal ball question, what are you, what are you looking forward to? And, and I, you know, if we were sitting here a year or two from now, are, are things better? Are they worse? Is it uncertain? Now everybody I'm sure up here has linked to, to benefits from people buying real estate, so it's all gonna be better. Um, <laughs> but maybe you can hit a little bit on what are the risks you see? If there's something that keeps you up at night, what is it? And Colby, you want to get started? Well, I, keeping me up at night, I've got three kids under five, so I'm up anyway. <laughs> I, I would tell you that um, you know, I think the outlook is still really good for real estate. And, and a, you know, in the, even from a Houston lens, I would say that nationally, if you look at where the industry stands in terms of total transaction activity, 2014 was just over 400 billion. 
which was the second highest year on record. And if you look at the way we're trending going into 2015 and if our national pipeline and just RFP volume is any indication of what we're anticipating, we think 2015 is gonna be a record year for the industry. Um, I think that has a lot to do with the amount of capital that's pouring into our space because of the relative value and performance of real estate compared to anything else. Um, the foreign capital influx is greater than it's ever been. 11% of all transaction activity in 2014 was foreign buyers in the US, and, it, and the motivations are, are much more than just, than just return. It's, it's diversification out of their country, it's diversification out of their currency. And, and, and you can pull up, just pull up Bloomberg and look at, look at what the 10-year bond is trading at in Germany at 35 basis points. And, I think the Swiss bond is, you gotta pay them 25 basis points to, to buy the paper, but it's, uh, compare it to US Treasury at 218 today, the relative value argument is still really good, and fundamentally in the US, we're finally, finally starting to see a little bit of expansion and, and some growth. So I, I believe the industry as a whole in 2015 will be as strong as it's ever been because of the amount of capital that's in the space. Um, I would say in Houston, it's probably a little bit more reserved only because of the energy headlines, but I think that's short-lived. Um, I'm probably more optimistic than most in, 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 in how long it's gonna take to play itself out. Um, in, in terms of what I would be concerned about, the fact that there is so much capital in the system, you, you, there's the risk that it becomes more irresponsible. Um, if you compare the underwriting standards and the approach to the, the markets today, versus what it was in 2007 before the recession, it's vastly different. And while you have property prices, cap rates that are at the same levels or better in 2014 as they were in 2007, the big difference, and Pat touched on this, is that borrowing cost was drastically different, and 200 to 250 basis points different. So you can actually buy with positive leverage today versus in 2007, you might have paid the same five and a half cap for the office deal we, we described, but you were borrowing at six and you just assume that you'd have enough growth to invert that in a short period of time. If you looked at how returns were comprised, people were so focused on reversion, because they didn't have any current cash yield, their, their total return was totally dependent upon their exit. And so when you look at the composition of returns today, it's much more balanced between current cash flow return and reversion, which is healthy. So while you have a lot of capital and you compare it to what it was in 2007, the last time things really, really got off the track, I do think it's really, really in a much more favorable position and it feels good. If there's any concern, it's that there's so much capital coming into our space that it has the tendency to get more and more aggressive. Thanks, and I, I will, as an aside, I will say one of the great challenges of teaching finance in the post-crisis era is explaining to students negative interest rates. Hold my, hold my money and I'll pay you to hold it for me. It's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to understand. Um, so Pat, what about you? Sure, uh, in migration and job growth remain robust. So I, I'm, I'm uh, overly positive bias broker. Uh, the concern is supply and uh, always has been in Texas. Um, so we watch that closely. Uh, we're building a lot of units. Um, absorption is, is going fine, steady as she goes. And um, so I think uh, 15, you know, we can already go out to 16, um, looks healthy because the supply pipeline curves downward slightly. It's 17, 18, you know, um, with what's going on in Houston, do we have more coming out of the ground in Austin, San Antonio? That's yet to be seen. But as long as job growth and immigration remain robust, um, I don't see anything that slows us down. Jack? I mean, I, I'm, I'm optimistic as well. You know, I can, I can see out maybe two or three years, and um, I don't see a real problem in our sector. In fact, I can only see it getting better with rental rate growth. And our industry, whether it's industrial office or apartments or retail, more and more of the industry is controlled by institutions, and there's so much information readily available. And the minute a uh, submarket or a city starts to get overbuilt, uh, the institutional capital will, will stop. Uh, you know, back in the 80s, uh, every developer and his brother could go out and build a, a speculative office building or industrial building on the same day. And you know, then you saw what would happen with rents when that happened. But now most of the, uh, whatever name you see on the developer's sign, there's usually a big institution behind it and that they're gonna stop the development if it gets too out of whack. I mean, the United States is growing 1% uh, a year, you know, with either with, you know, babies or, or immigration. And that's, you know, that's 30 something million people over a 10 year period of time. That's the same size as a country like Spain. So we have a lot of things behind us. I mean, you could be, wor you could be worried about external 
you know, events happening around the world, and that does have an effect uh, when, when that happens, uh, does slow down uh, real estate and affects the economy in general. So, uh, and everybody talks about interest rates, but still they have a lot of room to, to grow before they're back to historical levels. So I'm not really uh, too worried about oversupply or, or interest rates or tenant demand, and it, it would have to be something external that would be unpredicted. Does st strong dollar help industrial? Do you see that yet, or is it people talk about it or not? They don't really don't really uh, talk about it as much. I mean, there's some currencies are very weak, but we're you know uh, the Canadian dollar is really weak, and we're seeing a lot of Canadian investments coming here to the U.S. Uh, I think it's a it's certainly an issue to be hedged and taken into consideration. Uh, you know, in Mexico and places like and actually other parts of the world, a lot of the leases are dollar denominated. So it's such a strong currency, and it's such a predictable, safe currency that leases made in, uh, in, in Central and South America, Mexico, and even parts of Europe are in dollars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I've got, I've got 10 minutes. Thank you, Will. I'm getting a 10-minute sign. So let me open up for, to the floor for questions uh, from the group. And Carrie has a mic, and I don't know if we have a couple of mics around. So um, please don't be shy. <laughs> So I've been following the water crisis in Sao Paulo, Brazil with interest and just worry a little bit about water in Texas. How does that affect your real estate development decisions and encouragement of people to buy real estate in Texas? I mean, I think it's a big issue too. I mean, with uh, all this population and uh, you know, concern about water. I was over in a Cutter you know, Qatar is how you might think it's pronounced, but I was over in Qatar a couple of weeks ago, and they had these giant farms there, and it's a desert, and they have giant farms, and they have, uh, it's all with desalinized plants. Of course, they can afford to have a desalinization plant, but they had tomatoes that were this big, and it's just amazing what you can do with that, and they were talking about 30 years ago, Saudi Arabia was going to uh, tow up icebergs from Antarctica, and tow them up to the Persian Gulf and have them melt and they would condensate and they would call, cause clouds and rain. So you, 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 we can, if we had to get, get water, we could always get it from the, uh, the ocean. But you're right, I mean, it really is, a, you, if you look at sprawling uh, development of houses and all this density, it, it does, you do have to ask questions about water. We happen to have a delegation from the UAE in the school yesterday and they were talking about desalina de desalination as well. And, they had an idea at one point they were going to send out oil tankers and bring them back full of water. Uh, it turned out it got dirty, I guess, and they didn't, <laughs> didn't do it. Um, it was too expensive to keep it clean. But, but they, they said it's, it's available, it's just a price point question. Right, right. Um, I'd also say that, that LEED certification, so energy efficiency, just about every building, whether it's new product or existing, it is, is really required to, to step into that space to be competitive with the rest of the market, both from an institutional demand standpoint and just from a, a leasing standpoint, I think it's it's pretty much the norm. Can I, can I, just real quick on that, is that is that Houston guilt that you all are energy companies and so you'll build lead buildings, or is it um, the eventually the institutional investors want it for liquidity reasons? Is it is it is it is it economics or is it? Yeah, it's it's it, there's not a real quantifiable difference in terms of rents or values. Uh, and we've studied it for 10 years trying to figure it out if, if, there, if that really existed. But I think it's, I think it's more about uh, just being environmentally conscious and thinking about renewables and thinking about what you just described. I, I think that the market has embraced it enough to where the, the outliers that don't have it are almost differentiated. It's a box that needs way. to be checked. Yeah, yeah. so the boxes yeah. really need, just needs to be checked and people have to pursue it and, and really the market's taken hold of it. I would say every apartment community today has some type of certification uh, depending on you know which grade and which level, they are all recycling. They are all um, have gardens now that they're putting in next mm -hmm. to their dog park. Um, it's more marketing. Uh, I can't go get more money for the asset based on that, but the developers have embraced it, and and uh, their marketing people will sell it as as renters come in the door. Does it renters care? Is We're environmentally friendly. Do you think the renters care? Do they care? You know, I think um, there is a class of renters that are very interested in being environmentally friendly and there's a class that could care less and it's just cost and walkability. Well, it's gotten, it's, that's a, at least it's a little shift. I remember a few years ago we had a, a panel in our real estate center and one of the apartment developers said, well, the closest I've come is I painted a, an apartment door green once. 
Um, <laughs> so, so having some renters care is, is a step in that. I, that's okay. That's true. question is, do you not have data over the past, uh, I don't know how long you've been studying this, about OPEX and how that and lead buildings right. over time are significantly lower? Isn't that a That's measurable, a re real that is measurable. value, you know, investment uh, element? So I was Yeah, that, that is measurable from an operating expense standpoint, and really the, that, that ultimately comes down to the ability to attract tenancy and, and, and obtain really top of market rents. And so if you can differentiate an operating expense in an office building, that's lower than a competitive building, your overall cost to the tenant, because these are generally triple net leases and an obligation to the tenant to pay those costs, uh, it differentiates you from a, from a demand standpoint, from a tenant standpoint. You know, we're seeing, in a, there's a couple of big, uh, beautiful industrial parks in Los Angeles, and they have, um, uh, these parks are all owned by the same company, and they have put uh, solar panels on the roofs. And if you think about it, a million square foot building has got a million square feet <laughs> of roof space that's, uh, you know, 30 acres of uh, roof space they have up there and they, and they cover it with solar panels. You can't do it just, it's not efficient for just one building to have that. Some big corporations have a, a community conscience and they want to do something like that and they do it on their own nickel. But if, if you start to see that happening in these big parks, that's going to be an environmental a benefit. My understanding from the data, one, one of the, I think people I've talked to believe it's more efficient. The hard part has been they tend to be the newer buildings. And so with, you know, in class A, good quality stuff. And so it's hard to pull apart. You want to run the experiment of two brand new buildings identical, except one was lead, one was not. That's what's difficult to run that experiment, I think. So, okay, who else? I guess uh, <clears throat> on your industrial properties, uh, are most of these built for the tenant? In other words, are they uh, spec type developments? Uh, I'd, I'd say most of the construction is uh, speculative today. Mm -hmm. In 2008, 9, 10, 11, all of, most of the construction was build the suits for a specific uh, corporate user. Uh, so, but most of it today, the greater percentage would be speculative. But even the build the suits that take place, there's a, a give and take between the developer and the tenant to design the building as if it could ultimately be re-let re to somebody else in the future or it could be divisible, divided. So, you know, the specifications and, the, and especially the dimensions of the building are what fits the submarket. But most of the construction is um, speculative. And uh, these REITs that, that uh, you know, are investing in properties, uh, are they investing primarily in properties that have national and international tenants? Uh, or do they, you know, go down to strip centers or something? I think, well, that's like some of the other panelists said that for office, especially, you know, you want to have better credit tenants, but, um, you know, it's, it's a mixture. I mean, there could be some big global international tenant, but he's only is leasing 20,000 square feet. So it doesn't have to be a giant tenant to be a, a big national credit. But I think our economy is uh, mostly small businesses in the United States. So, so if you just follow that metric, probably half the rent rolls in the U.S. are made up of smaller non-national non, non or non-international companies. All right, well, Lil stood up, so that's my signal. Um, help, would you please help me thank our panelists? Thanks a bunch. Thanks. Thank you.